How's it going, everybody? It is your favorite apostates. My name is McKay. And I'm Jordan. And we're back. And this week's episode is chosen by our patrons. They are awesome. If you would like to participate in the choosing of one topic every month, go ahead and head over patreon.com slash Jordan and McKay, and you can participate in next month's or any of the following months uh, voting of the topics, the running of the topics. It's really cool. Uh, we appreciate our patrons. We try to do different topics every time. That way you're not just like voting one out and then the recipients carry over or anything like that. So we're going to try and go as long as we can with <laughs> that pattern <laughs> before we do anything. Jordan, what was the topic that was chosen by our patrons this month? This month they were given three options. This one... Like, what's the word I'm looking for? One by a landslide? Yes, it did. Like, right off the bat, too. So we are going to be talking about Pioneer Trek, um, which is a interesting Mormon experience. Yeah. A lot of us in the ex-Mormon space like to refer to it as Pioneer LARPing, <laughs> um, which if you don't know what LARPing is... No shame in, there's nothing wrong with people LARPing, but it's called, it's live action role play is the acronym. It's where you, it's like a role playing, but uh, you're doing it in real life. You dress up, you try to get the immersion and everything like that. So it's an experience. I'm just gonna put a couple things up front just so everybody's on the same page. We need to first kind of address the history of what Trek is based around. Then we'll talk about where it came from. And then I'll share some of my experiences as well as some of the experiences of people from Reddit and people that we know. Uh, because <laughs> experiences vary greatly. Uh, there's, it, it varies from totally pleasant to god awful nightmare fuel. <laughs> and, and there's no consistency. So let's start off first talking about the history of the Mormon pioneers and where that started. If you've never been to our channel before, uh, a brief little bit about the transfer of power between original Mormon prophet Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Joseph Smith was the killed. OG homie. The the man, the myth, the mason. I'm going with that last. I came up with that in the moment in the last <laughs> episode. I'm going to continue using that because I can't think of any better, more fitting <laughs> title for the guy. Joseph Smith was killed by a mob that came into the jail cell that he was being held at because he was a shady person and he did shady things in 1844. This created a lot of issues for the Mormons who at the time were basically congregated in Nauvoo, Illinois. That's where most of them were. A lot of people were immigrating from Europe and gathering there because it was Zion. That's where they had the, at the time, the only temple that was being built in Nauvoo. Now, when Joseph died, there was a lot of weirdness surrounding because he was the prophet, but there was like no contingency for who was supposed to be the next prophet. I guess it was kind of an oversight of God to be like, uh, yeah, I guess you're going to have to figure out who's going to be the next prophet because... A lot of people, including Emma Smith, Joseph's first wife, were under the impression that Joseph Smith III, Joseph the prophet's son, was to be the next prophet. And a larger majority of the people were under the impression that Brigham Young should be the next prophet and lead them to Zion or lead them as a whole. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So there's some weird things going on. Perse persecution it keeps going on. Um, Chaos in the extreme. The man of God that is leading these people yeah. has just been what they believe to be martyred for their cause. So the people who believe in this cause, they are they are bought in. And a lot of them have a lot of other reasons why they're in this altogether. So they're trying to finish the temple. There are people who, as always, are trying to get them pushed out of where they are. And then in 1846, Brigham, after the, the completion of the temple, he's like, you know what? Fuck it. 
I had a vision and we need to go out west to the frontier, basically, and settle in a place where we're not going to be persecuted for our sketchy polygamist practices and the likes. So and let us just make it crystal clear <laughs> at this point for any TBMs who have their Garmies in a bunch over this. Let's just make this crystal clear. News on March coming soon. We don't have, we do not believe that anybody should be persecuted for religious beliefs, systems, yeah. institutions, etc. Like everybody has the ability to ascribe to what they want to believe in, right? We absolutely fully stand by that. Nobody yeah. should be, you know, forced to do something or not be able to do something that they want to do in the religious realm or spirituality or beliefs or what have you. So this is not a, we're going like, yeah, it's cool that Mormons were persecuted for being Mormon because no, no it wasn't. Yeah. The, the extermination order in Missouri is 100% unconstitutional. It was not okay to do that. Uh, that's not how you solve hard problems <laughs> by just killing people. And we have both of us come from pioneer ancestry, direct pioneer ancestry. We are thoroughly embedded within Mormon history as far as pioneers go. And so we have major respect for the pioneers who were just trying to do the best that they could and follow who they believed to be a prophet yeah. at the time. So let's just make that perfectly clear. Of course, we don't... <laughs> We don't like Mormonism um, and Brigham Young, particularly. All the other Angelus. pioneers, um, you know, were basically just kind of led. They had basically no other choice or to die. So Brigham Young is like, I've had a vision. We need to go out west. I know exactly where we need to go. Don't worry. I saw it in my mind. Um, those of you who are of the true church of God, you'll follow me. And those who aren't will become a splinter church. Um, and you'll and you end suck. up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the birth of the RLDS church. That's a really reductionist. Restored. Thing. But I'm just trying to get to the, the meat and potatoes of what we're talking that about. That could here. be another video for another day. They are still yeah. a current sect of Mormonism. Yes, to this day. Um, they're known now as the the community of Christ. But those Correct. were the people who believed that Joseph Smith the third was to be the prophet, and they have a direct line of Joseph Smith as their prophet. The first Mormons arrive in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847, um, about a year or so after Brigham Young said, "Hey, we need to go out west. I've had a vision." He just kind of pulled in, and I don't know what the hell he was seeing, but he was like, yep, this is the place, and fast forward 150 years, and we're drowning in pollution, and it's a constant drought, and just, this this place is terrible. Do not come to Salt Lake City. It is the worst. <laughs> I don't know what he, this dude saw in the vision. Now they have a whole but, monument here that's actually yeah. called This is the Place Monument, where Brigham Young supposedly decided that this is the place. So a lot of kind of what images are conjured up in the mind when you talk about pioneers is like covered wagons and livestock and like Oregon Trail, you've died of dysentery kind of um, Dumb looking things. hats. Yeah, and, and that's definitely there were a lot of Mormon pioneers that did that, but I think there were already people who were established here like in Nauvoo and things like that where they could afford to buy a wagon um, so a lot of them came over in that, the next few years and they started, um, kind of settling in the Salt Lake Valley. But like I said, there were still a lot of people who were being converted in Europe and coming to the United States. And they were being told by the people who were convert, converting them that they needed to go to Zion, like that was the whole push for the entirety of the faith at the time was for everybody to come to Salt Lake City and build up Zion. So a large amount of urgency there, a large amount of urgency there. Those people who had money, it was a lot easier for them. I mean, it was made for them. People like Brigham Young, they had livestock and wagons and their Not families that it was with easy, them. But it was Not that easier. it was easy, but I mean, when you have enslaved people to do a lot of things for you, which Brigham Young did, then it kind of eases the burden 
But I mentioned immigrants from Europe and things like that because that's where the story surrounding Trek kind of started was with the Willie and Martin Handcart Company. Those people who didn't have a lot of money, who immigrated from overseas, they did not get wagons. They did not have livestock that they already had. They had to make do with the little means that they had. So a popular way for people with little money to be able to cross the plains was to build hand carts and put what little belongings they had, children and things like that, in, uh, that sounds like I was talking about children as belongings. <laughs> <laughs> things they like... had, comma, children, other things, um, and make it across the plains. This meant that they had to push these carts, in, hence the name hand cart. Um, they were the sole mode of propulsion <laughs> for these hand carts. So they would pull these carts nearly a thousand miles. Usually the journey would start in far west, which is now kind of like modern day Omaha. From there to Salt Lake City, which is far. That's why they call it a trek. So the, the Mormons were already kind of established. It, about 10 years had passed since they first arrived in the Utah Territory. Uh, in 1856, the William Martin Handcart Company set out from far west very late in the season. They were told by everybody that they shouldn't be leaving, but they left on August 17th for the one handcart and August 27th for the other. Now, this we're talking about nearly a 1,000 miles walking. You'd have to average about 10 miles a day in order to make it in under 100 days, which when you're starting off at August, that leaves almost no time <laughs> for you to make it to your destination where there's any sort of like downtime or anything. You have to be going every single day to be able to make it past the snow. And that's just counting that the snow will arrive at the normal time in the winter like it always does. But for this band of people, that was not the case. The snow hit extremely early and it was an absolute disaster for these two handcart companies. One of them, the Martin Handcart Company, got stuck in a snowstorm at the very beginning of November in Wyoming at a place called Martin's Cove. They were literally halted in just drifted snow in this small cove for five days because the storm was so bad. To paint a picture, a lot of them, there was no food, a lot of them only had the shoes that they started out with and ended up walking barefoot in the snow. And it was For children. an overall disaster. Of the 980 people that were in this handcart company, about 210 of them died, which was the highest casualty count of any um, pioneer expedition that there was at the time. So like Jordan said, this is not something that is like, oh yeah, it's the Mormons dying. That's what we want. That's absolutely not what we want. It definitely, it's a tragedy. By any way you cut it, there's there's no getting around it. It's terrible that it happened to them. So this has spawned a lot of folklore and stories and things like that. When I was a teenager, they had two movies that I remember watching pretty regularly that were actually pretty well produced and made. One of them was called uh, 17 Miracles and the other one was called Ephraim's Rescue. They were both kind of historical fiction, I guess is what you call them, uh, because the main character was fictitious, but it was based around the events of the Willie and Martin Hancock Company's strategy and everything like that. So, I don't know. Those are really what I would consider faith-promoting propaganda because there's a lot of unverified things, and it's called 17 Miracles because there's miracles that happen because the handcart companies were so faithful and everything like that. But, I mean, this is... They are really jarring and emotional films, and they are meant for sure to incite emotional situations where people will feel more faithful in the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So there was stuff like that, um, tons of art 
and you hear it just about hear about it just about every general conference where people will talk about the faith of the pioneers and the handcart companies. It's very much a almost like a dick measuring. It's suffering porn. It totally is. And Mormons are live for that suffering. Yeah. Suffering a, brings me blessings. The more trials I have, the better type of mentality. It's a huge culture in the Mormon church to see suffering as confirmation for what you're doing is to be be right or persecution is because you're correct. So it's and, a gift. And yeah. I'm going to endure it with a smile on my face. Yeah. Which I hate because it, it kind of just puts the emphasis that, oh my God, they were doing, they did such a great thing and everything like that without, you know, just kind of glossing over the fact that people were buried in the snow because the ground was too frozen. And then once the snow melted, the elements and animals would have at them. So it's... Because Brigham Young said, let's go west. Yep. Let's go west so we can do our unethical polygamy in peace. So... And then that backfired. That totally <laughs> backfired, yeah. So this is the basis that we talk about, or that sur that the pioneer trek surrounds. Um, Many Mormons have pioneer ancestry. Yeah. It's very it's, much like in your face. It's like a badge of honor. The um, I ha Both of us have ancestors who are in the Salt Lake City Cemetery who have those little badges. Um, I'll put one on the screen, but just to describe for the listeners, it's like a kind of gold metal badge that they put on headstones to denote that a person was a, pioneer. a Mormon pioneer, which is like a really huge honor. And as far as people colonizing the West, it was really pivotal oh, yeah. for that. Like I've got, we got gold badges everywhere. I yeah. got great, great grandparents who was married to like eight different women and they're all buried next to each other and they've all got badges. So cute. Really cute. Yeah. Oh, and I, I, I forgot to mention to John D. Lee that I might, I don't know if I'm related to, um, to <laughs> David O. McKay, the former Mormon prophet, but I definitely am related to a guy whose name is in the Doctrine and Covenants. So eat your heart mm -hmm. out, friendo. And so this like pride and pioneer ancestry is kind of what gives birth to the idea of the pioneer trek. An important thing to note here, um, it is now well documented, well talked about, there's journals, conference talks, like a plethora of, you know, literature, I guess you could say, and talks given by leaders within the Mormon church about pioneers. However, that was not a thing until Brigham Young died because Brigham Young is a, I, we're going to have to bleep any words that I would say. So let me think of a nicer word. A jerk. Because essentially they make the trek, all these people die, people start getting wind of what happened and everybody looks to Brigham and is like, WTF, dude, like this was your charge. Yeah. What the hell? Everybody was faithful and uh, believing in the Lord and a bunch of people died. A bunch of people died. Mothers and fathers buried children along the way. Like this was no yeah. easy experience for anybody. So... Uh, Brigham got all garments in a wad about everything and essentially like lashed out at a bunch of the members. And so everybody went quiet about it for a while and things kind of didn't really reconvene until Brigham Young died because then everybody felt comfortable actually talking about the experiences because anytime people would bring them up, he would be like, oh, you're talking about me and how terrible I am. Yeah. No, I'm going to go get another enema and you're going <laughs> to shut up. The history kind of of Trek re-becoming a thing is well documented in an article, an article that we found from the Deseret News, which is, fun fact, actually owned by the church. <laughs> um, Keep those ad blockers on, folks. <laughs> and so this article kind of details it well, but the first event that, and McKay will put some of this up here, but 
There was nothing related to like these reenactments of Trek, really. There was a group of handcart veterans that marched in 1897 in Salt Lake City in a parade, and it was kind of a a little bit of a rejuvenation of people's faith in the experience, and it's kind of yeah. put more of a positive light on it. Um, and then it kind of morphed into, and I don't know if we've talked about this before, but the Mormon Church and the Boy Scouts... Super intertwined for Super a long intertwined. time. Yeah. Like, they weren't, it wasn't just like they were friends. Like, weren't they like contracted or something with each other? I think other? so, yeah. Because when all that Boy Scout controversy came out, they formally yeah. moved well, away. It was extremely Scouts. beneficial for the, the Boy Scouts because of the fundraising efforts that, I mean, we would do Friends of Scouting like every year and so many people would give. To friends of scouting. So, Boy Scouts began to hike over the last miles of the Mormon Trail from Hennifer to the mouth of Immigration Canyon. Um, but that's like really the first kind of starting at the turn of the century, kind of starting reintegrating this into regular like Mormon life. Um, and then... In 1968, 44, 44 girls from East Long Beach Stake in California came to Utah with homemade handcarts to also trek from Hennifer to This is the Place Monument that we talked about earlier that's in Salt Lake. They took a year to prep for this. Um, Damn. They sewed their own clothing. They prepared getting in shape by doing timed mile runs. They learned how to break bread to like full wow, this pioneer is experience. Um and so that was in 1968. And then in the 70s, hand cart treks were offered starting at Ricks College and BYU. Ricks is now BYU Idaho and then BYU Provo here in Utah. Bro, I can't even imagine Ricksburg in the 70s. It sucked in the 2010s. <laughs> <laughs> it Sorry, sucks Idaho. now. <laughs> So BYU kind of started this experiment all over again with Trek and hand carts and whatnot. They had people who took on this on the staff, and then they took students majoring in youth leadership to help run the program. And so the BYU student leaders were the Ma's and Pa's, and they had sponsored youth hand cart treks and instructions on hand cart trek conduction. And it was put into the curriculum for students until the early 1990s. So it was a regular part of... Oh, wow. college life at BYU. I would have been really annoyed if I had to do that while I was in college. Um, and we'll talk about why. So this wasn't like a, a regular thing for youth to do at the time. This was more of like a college age, just kind of rite of passage for people at BYU Idaho for a while, right? Yeah. Well, and as BYU started to do it, then other people started to consider that this might be done on a stake level, especially after that one stake decided to do it themselves. So then word starts to spread. BYU starts to set the example. Church leaders starts to take notes and realize that this could be like a stake-wide or a, you know, a statewide even church activity, multi-stake yeah. activity um, that could be had to have a pro faith-promoting experience for yeah, and that kind of really started off, and uh, 1997 was the, sesqu the sesquicentennial <laughs> anniversary There's of a word. the, yeah, the, the 150-year anniversary of the Mormon pioneers arriving in Utah, so there was a lot of shit going on, like, the whole year, basically, but basically in summer, because uh, Pioneer Day, July 24th, which is a state holiday here in Utah, uh, commemorates the arriving of the Mormon pioneers every year, July 24th. But July 24th, 1997 was the big year for the anniversary of those pioneers entering the Salt Lake Valley. Um, just a, a couple of the things that were going on. They had parades. There was a whole, um, like program put at the by put on at the BYU stadium called Faith in Every Footstep or something like that. There was like a that's wagon the, train. That's what the oh, that's where the badges come yes. from. Okay, I yeah, yeah the uh, the badges I already footstep. showed them, but they say Faith in Every Footstep, so that so makes a lot more sense. You probably knew that by now, but yeah, just... 
it just clicked for me because I I was like that sounds familiar, but I don't know why. Yeah. Um, there was a uh, a wagon train reenactment that arrived at the this is the place state park, um, and they were greeted by the the prophet president at the time, Gordon Hinckley. There was also a hand cart that was built in Siberia and trekked through 17 cities in Russia and Ukraine, which is kind of awkward now. Um, They were trekked through those cities in Russia and Ukraine, then brought to the United States and presented to that same Gordon Hinckley in the lobby of the Salt Lake City Church office building, the church headquarters. We're going to throw a picture up of what it looks like and you comment, what do you think it looks like? Mm. The circles on either side (laughs) are a little suggestive This is not a joke. Um, Yeah, if you're listening, look up church office building Mormon headquarters or something like that. And maybe you'll understand a little bit what we're saying. Um, But yeah, there's there was a a big to do about the sesquicentennial. It was on TV. There was all kinds of stuff going on. So that kind of kicked off this interest in the Mormon pioneers in nowadays. And people started doing those hand cart treks for the youth in their localized areas. Mind you, it's for the youth for a reason. Yep. So let's rapid fire just talk a little bit about Trek on the whole, what most people are experiencing nowadays. Trek is only pr- or primarily for the youth ages 14 to 18. Each youth is assigned a group called a family. Each family has a ma and a pa um, that are like the parents of the group, but really they're just adults that are kind of in charge of the kids. Everybody. Um, These adults, isn't it a calling? Or is it just a... It kind of is, it yeah. It kind of is a calling. Yeah, because you... It, I mean, they usually take like a year to prepare things and they're they're doing everything. And you when get voluntold. I went, yeah, you get voluntold. <laughs> they're like, hey, will you do this? Will you go walk in Wyoming for in the summer. three days in the summer? And also, you have to wear Pioneer clothing and you With don't get your cell phone. a bunch of hot, sweaty teenagers. Yeah, <laughs> and kids are still learning hygiene and nobody's getting a shower anyway. <laughs> Um, at least that's how I experienced it. Like I said, at the beginning of this, there's not a lot of consistency and not all, everybody is close to the Wyoming area. Growing up in Colorado, it was not much of a drive for us, but out East and in the South and everything, they'd kind of do their own flavor of it, which would be way fucking worse. If you ask me to do it in the South, um, they did it in Ukraine and Russia, I guess they had somebody pushing that hand cart so and to that point fun. they've said from that Deseret news article that i read um it kind of ties in with what you just said so to reduce costs stakes have tried to find places closer to home to hold the treks then inex- it's an expensive proposition to travel the church's historic sites in wyoming to push hand carts on historic trail segments for stakes on the wasatch front here in utah the church owns desert land and livestock property west of evanston wyoming which is why Trek gets pushed there because it's church owned land. Yeah. Um, and then there's another part of Utah in Utah County that's also owned that they use for a different Trek yeah. experience. So for people who are close to here, kind of in the West, not too far West, but kind of in like the, the Morador, Colorado, Wyoming, those areas, they go to the actual historical sites. Um, in my experience, I went Let's see. It was in 2011, I think. I turned 15 that year. Uh, I was pissed because the time at Trek spanned when my birthday was going to (laughs) be. So I was not able to get my learner's permit on my birthday. And it was actually like a couple weeks out from there because my mom just didn't have time to take me. So I was pissed. (laughs) Plus, I had to have my birthday dressed like a pioneer on the planes, pulling a freaking hand cart. Um, so that was fun, but we went, we kind of, we started off at the Martin's Cove historical site. You load up onto the buses. They chartered some buses for us. We got there. They gave everybody, every family a hand cart. We all pushed our hand carts to the site. Uh, we got hailed on that fucking sucked. (laughs) We walked around the site. It was, it was a, 
a pretty spiritual experience because there were more than a handful of people that died just because they were snowed in in this cove for five days straight. So it was pretty, you know, pretty emotional for a lot of people and things like that. Myself included, honestly, it was a thing. The next day was my birthday. It had rained all night. We had to trek through mud puddles and cross rivers And then the final day, we did the last stretch before the handcart companies were met by rescue, which was Rocky Ridge, which was the longest leg. I think we did 14 miles that day, and it was the absolute worst. Everybody had blisters, and we were all dehydrated and clinging to life by the end. And they had... We camped at this one site by the river and there was all kinds of like folklore tales of, oh, sometimes the spirits of these pioneers can be felt here. And they had like a little fireside meeting and all our parents had written us letters and we all opened our letters to be read there and everybody was crying. I don't know why I was. My parents were there. (laughs) I just wasn't in their family. My Basically, my whole family was there, except for my one. Are red sibling. flags waving for you all yeah. over this experience? Because they should be waving high and proud at this moment. Yeah. So this is basically just what do you call it? Love bombing and indoctrination through a traumatic experience. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people maybe won't see eye to eye on that, and a lot of people maybe didn't have the same experience as I did. But um, there was it, just along the way, there was so much that was going on that was just unbelievably like I look back on it now and I'm like, I can't believe that they do this to kids. Well, and the writing the letters to have writing the letters. Read, yeah, like, we had um, when you're already physically beaten down. And so emotionally, yes. it's going to be even easier to kind of appeal to you in that way. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you're the immersion, honestly. It it only broke a couple times. Like, during the day, we were in the thick of it. Everybody was pushing their hand carts. We all had made, like, flags for each of our families to kind of denote our identity and things like that. We didn't have cell phones. I mean, it was only 2010 or 2011, so it wasn't like everybody had smartphones. But you weren't allowed. Yeah, you weren't allowed to have them. Nobody was allowed to take, there was no showers or anything like that. So the most that you got washed is if there was, you were crossing a river or whatever and you wanted to take a dip. We had, because the pioneers were known for singing songs, we had a guy who was dedicated to, he had, he was a musician. He would run up and down the handcart train with his guitar and like play Mormon hymns that we would all sing along to. So there's also that. The single most thing that I look back on that I need to mention that I cannot believe we did was something that we called the women's poll. And I will put up a picture of it right now. This picture doesn't really do it justice on how fucking terrible this hill was, but all of the men and boys lined up along the trail and the remaining women had to get the rest, uh, everybody's hand carts up the hill by themselves and the majority of us were men and boys so everybody lined up along the trail and we were completely silent and couldn't do anything and we just stood there as a bunch of our compatriots had to struggle up the hill and this was kind of like to represent the men who had died and left widows and they still needed to go on the track and they it just is a whole lot of yikes to me there's it is a much better ways to commemorate the strength of women than that and it is like i haven't come across a person who's talked about their trek experience and hasn't mentioned some sort of women's poll during the whole experience and typically people who like enjoyed or were deeply impacted by trek say that's like the one of the most like poignant things that happened for them during that trip. And here's the thing that gets me about this is I, I did not go on track. I probably should have said this from the beginning. I did not go. I was a shitty Mormon at the time, so I didn't go, but there's kind of two different directions that one could go with the women's poll is 
and maybe a few more. And obviously, my feminism is going to be like oozing through my pores at this point. Yeah. But there's a few different ways that you can look at this, right? There's the sense that they are bringing attention to women and the strength of the women who were involved with this at the time because they did their own thing, much like the women of the history of the Mormon church, despite yeah. the fact that they get shit on and have no power now in Mormon history, they've demonstrated time and time again that they can hold their own. They don't need the men to help them and they have their own power and their own capabilities and they can, they can hold their own. Yeah. And so in one sense, it's an appreciation of the fact that they can do that. And there were strong women and by God, there were, but at the same time, I was just reading a Reddit post earlier from somebody talking about Trek that was like, this was the first experience that I had in the church where I realized that how those boys saw us. And it was a very, like, I don't know how you would put it. It was very obvious to her in the way that she talked about that experience that the way what the men and the boys walked away from that experience with for the most part was we have an obligation to take care of our women, to protect our women, to make sure that they don't ever have to do anything like this. And while I think that's fine and dandy maybe care fair in a case or two i think the overarching theme of this is demote women because they shouldn't have to do this and nobody wants to fucking do this men no. or women this is just shitty. nobody wants to do that nobody wants to do this but she said poignantly this was the moment that i realized the difference and how men see us in this church. And I think it is very much how I would look at that experience. It's almost pitying to me yeah. to look at. And that's my personal opinion. There are going to be people here who are like, oh, my God, it demonstrates the strength of those women. And I don't feel like the women's poll needs to be needs to happen in order to represent the strength of the women at the time. Yeah. Because that goes without saying, like, these women carried children, breastfed, nursed babies on this trail while they were walking. They had children. Like, they carried these children. I have a toddler. I cannot take him to Target without him <laughs> throwing a fit. I cannot imagine taking him thousands of miles without not knowing where food's going to come from, rationing water. Being hit by these. a winter storm. Yeah. That Having to bury children on the trail, having parents yeah. die, like watching people die around you. Like, I don't think the woman's poll is necessary to show the strength that was demonstrated by women at the time. I will hop off. Absolutely. Box. Yeah. So it was an extremely emotional experience for a lot of people. And it's experiences like those that kind of solidify people are like, will see have an experience like that and they'll equate that to they were so strong because god helped them like it, it kind of just discounts the fact that these women are just strong it doesn't have to be because god made them strong or anything it you know people are just strong the human spirit is just strong and i feel like we can just Humans appreciate that for a goddamn minute sometimes but they tie that idea of these people were strong because of their faith in God, because they were moving to Zion, because of all these things that surround the Mormon church, rather than uh, these people were just amazing. So there's that. When you're in the thick of it, what other choice do you have? You're in the middle of Wyoming yeah. in a winter storm. Are you going to go back or are you just going to what, get there what else do you i mean they, they really had no choice so they got there by any means necessary so yeah each of us were given uh, a person that we were supposed to be trekking for some of us were told that we uh, the person we were trekking for died or whatever i think i was a very small child <laughs> that i was assigned that brings up a really good so. point trek is not mandatory it is not an experience that Mormon youth have to complete in order to do X, yeah. Y, Z. But you are, especially if you have staunch Mormon parents, there's really no reason why you wouldn't go. Um, these trek really isn't formally structured. There's not really a lot of guidance from leadership on how things are to be done. There's some general things that have been like established and traditions and things of that nature but there's not like at least to my knowledge a handbook 
of how to run Trek. And so this leaves it up to each stake to kind of decide how they're going to do things. And that's why the Trek experience varies so widely yeah. based on the person. Because some people have Trek experiences who were like, we had chefs in our steak who came out and prepared like the bombest food I've ever eaten in my life. And, you know, we slept under the stars and we had, you know, it was, we had perfect mattresses and we were comfortable and we had plenty of water and they gave us Gatorade. And so it really depends on the stake yeah. in the church leadership and how Trek is going to pan out because some stakes and leaders take it a little bit too far. There's plenty of people who had absolutely God awful experiences on Trek, like including things like purposefully rationing water, not allowing people to drink water, not having people like not having the the youth eat like actual meals. Like there were some people in the that had shared stories about living off of like flour, like because that was yep. what their family had at the time, and it was the true authentic Mormon pioneer experience. Yeah, and we're not talking about like eating flour. We're talking about they would suck the flour off the corner of the flour sack because there was literally nothing to eat. This is what they're having people simulate. Way too or far. other extreme. I remember the, it was like the year or the, the, because it's not every year. It's usually every four years that they do it because it would be a lot of money if it were every year. But um, one of the previous times in a neighboring stake, the Aurora, Colorado stake, they took chickens that they were to, each family was to slaughter their chicken and cook it. Like, I, I understand people need to understand where their food comes from, but let's, you know. I don't think that was really necessary. And what do we have here that's... This is why we call it LARPing, because they're all about the immersion they in are. all the wrong ways. And the number one thing that's missing from this whole experience, especially as it pertains to youth, is informed consent. There's nothing... There's You aren't being informed expressly as a parent of what's going to happen in depth, in detail. Things are going to arise that you're not going to be aware of. They're not telling you... Like, yep, your kids are not going to, you know, we're going to ration the water. They're going to eat flour. That's typically not what they tell you. Like, yeah, nobody's going to want to do that. Uh, well, maybe they do because they just, it's the more, the Some suffering. parents are like, sign mm. me up. But I could see some parents that come back from this experience after hearing from their kids and being like, maybe this was a little too intense. Like, maybe yeah. I don't appreciate the way this was handled. And so heat stroke on these trips is common, beyond common. The... Now, from my understanding, the majority of places that do, the majority of stakes that run Trek will at least take one or two nurses with them for that purpose to help manage injuries, um, dehydration, things of that nature. There were a few stories that I read from people on Reddit who had been on Trek who the nurses brought like IVs to do intravenous hydration for people who were like really insanely dehydrated. Um but it's not uncommon to read stories from people who were like, all 50 of us were dying of heat stroke, like day one into Trek. Um, and it only gets worse because in 2016, a woman died on an LDS Pioneer Trek in Oklahoma. She was only 29, she had two kids, and she had heat stroke. She was taken by emergency medical helicopter to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to a, to a hospital where she was pronounced dead. Um, and she became ill at the end of a seven-mile hike the first day of the trek with temperatures above 95 degrees. Now, that temperature is not high, like not out of the ordinary for people completing trek. Like when yeah, no. these are being done in Wyoming, Arizona, Colorado, like these are, those temperatures in the summer are not unheard of yeah so it's not good it's there's a lot of things we're gonna read a couple of experience because it it varies pretty widely we had a couple people <laughs> message us their experiences oh, yeah. um there's a, a few that we found on r slash x mormon on reddit this first one comes from a person that we know she did give us permission to share this. Yes, yeah, she said it was okay. We didn't want to share other people's experiences because usually that's a little much. Hopefully you enjoyed the pictures of me. <laughs> if you're listening, sorry you didn't get to see those. So here is what she said from her experience. She said... Um, 
our steak planned the water situation very poorly, so they ran out of water at every stop before all of us got any. I remember literally sharing water with my friends by drinking as much as could fill the water bottle cap and passing it around. So like a teaspoon of water after pulling hand carts in 100 plus degree weather. I don't remember how often the stops were, but they were consistently out by the time our family got there. And remember, we're in layers on layers. I also homemade my bloomers and skirts with my mom. I'm genuinely not sure how our group actually survived. There was also a girl in our ward who was around 17 and had some form of developmental disability. I'm not sure how many stakes do this, but they handed out baby dolls to some of the families to pretend to have new babies on the trail. They gave her one and she loved it so much. You could tell how extremely pleased being a pioneer she was. Well, they killed it off. They literally came and took her baby doll because lots of babies died on the Pioneer Trail. As you can imagine, she was distraught. I remember people talking about it like it was this powerful moment to see someone cry over their dead baby like a real Pioneer woman. Nope. That is not. That is not faith promoting. That is indoctrination. And trauma. And trauma. It's trauma, <laughs> trauma-induced trauma indoctrination. The baby thing is also not uncommon. I have read countless stories of people who said they were either given sacks of flour to represent babies on the trail or they were actually given baby dolls. And there was actually one that I read where they did the same thing. They said, you know, babies died on the trail. So guess what? You're the special one for today. You get the trial card that says your baby's going to die. And they actually buried the baby, like the doll, on the trail. Oh, my God. Tell me how this doesn't F up kids. Tell me. And these are kids. Like, it, to participate, you have to be a kid under 18. Yeah. So. And it's not like, isn't it just like 12 and up typically? No, 14 to 18. 14 to 18. Yeah. So it's older. It's not like you've got like third graders doing yeah. this. But, but they're kids. But they're still. youth still. They're in a, a point in their lives where they're really malleable and this kind of trauma is if this is the kind of trauma that you have to induce in your kids in order to scare them into staying in your church reevaluate your church folks second um if this couldn't get any more toxic hold on to your butts because we're now about to throw good old classic racism into the mix because that's what Great. mormonism is love that so this comes from a reddit post obviously this is anecdotal but there were two others that i read that was that were similar to this so essentially they take the trek experience and they theme it like they model it after the book of mormon okay so it's like book of mormon or nephite themed trek um and so this person um, said that when they were 15 or 16, um, their stake decided that they were going to be Nephites. So instead of wearing the pioneer getup, they wore like indigenous people style dress. So um, like tunics, you know, the whole modeled after indigenous people um dress so <laughs> this is mortifying so they emphasized we're traveling to the promised land um they instead of being like calling their parent families ma and pa they were forced to call them the hebrew words for mom and dad and they even according to this person had to dance a traditional jewish group circle dance slash chant um so it sounds like it was just a cultural appropriation nightmare. And then he also said that one of the days that they were there, they woke up and their leaders had built a big Mayan style pyramid in the middle of a clearing overnight. And then Jesus came and spoke to us for like an hour. Um, Yikes. Well, and, and problems like this happen all the time. There's not a single person that's going to be like, hey, maybe hey, hey, hold up. That's probably not a good idea because taking indigenous and Jewish culture and just making it their own and we're part of the House of Israel is standard operations for the Mormon church because the Book of Mormon is said to be a historical record of 
ancient Jews that came across the Atlantic Ocean on a boat 500 years BCE and are the direct descendant or the the direct ancestors of modern indigenous peoples. If you didn't know that, there's a fun fact. Like, there's you. like a really <laughs> they they believe that to be literal. The Orthodox Mormon. If you're more nuanced, you understand, hey, maybe the Book of Mormon's not literal, or you're just you know that for sure it's totally made up. They're trying to in the last few but, years Jesus. they're venturing away from it being like a literal historical record. Yeah. Like I think didn't Rusty they're say not. something about that that it's No, it, it was it was not very cut and dry. It was not, okay. No. But they're trying to steer away from that because they know with factual inaccuracies and anachronisms in the Book of Mormon, they're stacking up. And so that doesn't bode well for yeah. the future of the church. But that's a topic for another day. Yeah. That, that's a little off topic. But <laughs> for that to be part of Trek Jesus, that is... No, not the play by any means. Not a fan of that at all. It is really... I can't believe that they're still doing this. My parents have done it twice. The first time they were ma and pa. And the second time they were kind of like coordinators, kind of getting everything planned and everything. They, I think they did it like two years in advance. They knew that they started planning and all this shit. Um, I, by that time I was in college, I didn't end up going. I think I kind of wanted to. I ended up taking the young women in our ward. They needed a chaperone to go train hiking a mountain. So I did that for them, but I got hella sunburned at Warped Tour and... <laughs> They took all of my aloe vera with them. Anyway. Cringe. Cringe. But the, these experiences are what stick with people. Like, I I only found those three photos that I, show, that I showed were the only three photos I could find of myself on that experience. But I can still remember it like yesterday. It was a super traumatic experience in a lot of aspects we hiked or we walked like nobody's business for a 14 year old i mean and you could see in those pictures i was not by any means in shape or athletic so that was a feat all on its own for me but then to be like trudging through mud and crossing rivers and it just was a a hell of an experience, honestly. And for a long time, that was kind of a solidifying of my faith in the Mormon church because I was like, what kind of people, and this kind of goes in tandem with something that one of the apostles said was like, why would they hike or walk in frigid snowstorm conditions, leaving tracks of blood from their bare feet in the snow if the Book of Mormon weren't true, if Joseph Smith weren't a prophet, the thinking in that is just totally illogical because they were swindled in a lot of cases. They did not know what was going on and they just believed that people were good in every sense of the word, which I think people should, but these people, a lot of them died because of the power that the Mormon prophets and everything like that. I don't even know where I'm going with this, but the trauma that these people experienced on like the the actual pioneers experienced is weaponized to make people currently feel like well they wouldn't have done it if it wasn't true and second anything that i'm going through pales in comparison to what they went yeah. through so it's really a diminishing stick that the church uses to measure things because it I was constantly told things like that like anytime the pioneers were mentioned it's like well any possible thing that I could be going through is like pales in comparison to that shit compared to what these guys went through and it, we're not <laughs> we don't do trauma olympics anymore that's that's not healthy I think there can be a reverence and respect held for the pioneers and what they've done without causing kids to have heat stroke. Yeah. Like, I don't know that these very, like, for the stakes that do very intense, you know, recreations of this experience that are, you know, rationing water and causing kids to get heat stroke and causing dehydration and all these things, I don't think that does what they think it does. 
I think it would be much more of a memorable and even positive experience if what they walk away with was, we heard the stories, we've had part of the experiences, we don't need to starve ourselves or restrict water in order to get the full picture of what was happening and in order to have respect for the people who did this. Yeah. Because the people who reflected positively on this experience had nothing but amazing things to say about it. And I think as a church, that would be the direction you'd want to go is have people remember yeah. it as it being this awesome, you know, faith promoting in a really positive way. But there's no standardization. There's so not. you're never going to be able to get a consensus on that. It's like Bishop Roulette. You don't, yeah. you don't know what you're going to get. You, you never know what you're going to get. And they can do all of this without a single mention of the also very atrocious things that Mormons did to indigenous peoples all across the frontier. And I'm not talking about just kicking them off of indigenous lands. I mean, actual murders and massacres. Massacres. So that's not talked about. Not talked about in the slightest. Those are not things that I didn't his. know until I was an adult. And it's not mentioned in yeah. any of the people that I've talked to. So maybe they're changing that. I would hope that one day they would, but I doubt it because that's not faith promoting. That's not, yeah, that's not a good look. Yeah. So that's a topic for another day, but uh, it's also important to, to know. So no, the Mormon pioneers that died on the trail should not be scoffed at or anything because they died believing what they were doing was what God was telling them to do and not just Brigham Young waking up one day and saying, fuck it, we're moving to Utah territory and anybody who can make it there is going to be cool with me. Anyway, that was kind of all over the place and crazy, wouldn't you say, dear? I would, but I think <laughs> it was interesting. It, it was interesting. I didn't really know how new the idea of Pioneer Trek was, like... 2010 or 2011 i can't i can't remember anything it's been at least 10 years so um that was only like 15 years off from when the people started really regularly doing it so that was crazy and yeah all the other stories i kind of already knew but it's just weird to kind of look at it through a different paradigm and not being critical of it because people were Mormons, but being more understanding that people were just trying to do what they thought was right. Our criticism comes directly at stakes and church leadership who are using this as a way to... Do not weaponize trauma of other people. Don't do that. No. We've already got enough gener generational trauma within Pioneer Lines in the Mormon church. We don't need to make that any worse and have historically inaccurate and misrepresentation misrepresentations of what actually was happening at the time and no mention of the land that actually belongs to indigenous people but that's a story for another day i hope you enjoyed this lovely all over the place description of pioneer <laughs> trek <laughs> yeah i wish i could share more pictures but literally there were only three we have like a, a shared one drive that my dad dump, dumps all the pictures into those were the only ones that I had of me but they weren't really around me so i have a funny meme one has. that mckay had already probably put in there by now but it's funny but it's not our picture this was chosen by our amazing patrons if you'd like to join our amazing patrons and you would like to vote on these topics that we do on a monthly basis please go over to patreon.com slash jordan mckay the link is in the description of the youtube video version of this if you are watching on YouTube and you haven't yet subscribed and joined the 40,000 other amazing people who have subscribed, go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you'd like to hear more of the things that we ramble on about incessantly. Um, if you'd like to get in contact with us, we do have a Discord. You can find the invite to this Discord in the description of this YouTube video. It's a great way to get in contact with both of us. I have notifications turned on, so if you wanna at me there and ask me a question, I usually am able to respond pretty quickly. Check us out on Instagram and TikTok. You can find us at Jordan and McKay on both of those. It's pretty awesome. Jordan is really active on Instagram all the time. We're gonna have a big announcement on all things merch coming next week. 
you're gonna wanna stay tuned for that. There is a couple highly requested things that we're gonna be dropping and a special surprise collaboration that we will be announcing next week. So stay tuned for that. Check out our Teespring and our Etsy store. Happy Brain Collective links are in the description as always. Jordan, do you have anything else? No, thanks for 40K. Thanks for 40K. You are all amazing. We wouldn't be here without you. We wouldn't be here without you. And uh, yeah, plan on a giveaway at 50K. So everybody get us there. Keep chugging along. Other than that, thank you for watching and sticking around, listening, and we will see you next time.